Um, so to, the, to that point, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and you, at, you asked it, that was one of your questions that you went through at, at the end, uh, but, but there's, unlike some questions at the end where you suggested an answer, I didn't hear a suggestion of an answer to this one, uh, but I'd like to talk about it is, um, in, in the U.S., you know, we have uh, a lot of uh, temporary employees on part-time on non-standard work, um, and I think the verdict's still, at least from the data I've seen, is as far as whether or not that leads to sort of a permanent status versus transitional. But I wanted to ask that question in the, in the case of Japan, or, or see if you have any indication, like how, you know, say, or maybe Anne, you know, like, like the, this, does it become very rigidly tracked once you get into, yeah. It's very hard, because the labor market, um, as uh, I know Arnie has written about this, um, as well as there is really a single port of entry, and that was why the transition from education to the, um, you know, the job was very important and was very significant. So you got tracked, um, uh, you know, at the very beginning, and then you did your, you know, you were able to. Um, the exchange for this hard work was you got these, these great benefits, uh, but you had this kind of, you know, uh, employment. So there is these kind of two tracks, and it's very difficult for a lot of women that I interviewed, and this is true even in the, um, the Equal Employment Opportunities Act, that um, you have to decide whether you want to be on the career track, that is the management track, especially with clericals, or not. And if you did it at a very early age, that's very hard. So I've talked to a lot of women uh, uh, who were young, as well as um, you know, uh, at other uh, uh, age groups, to find out that the younger women, they weren't sure. You know, they said, oh, I do want to have a family, however, I don't know. And then uh, talking to women who were now in their middle age, who were single by choice, I don't know, by drifting into that because of what is necessary, especially in the city of Tokyo, to you know, have a kind of career. So there is this kind of, it's very hard, um, and there's no real labor markets or transitional labor markets that you have in other countries for going from a full-time position to a part-time back to full-time, very, very difficult. And if you drop out, um, you know, to, have, to take care of your children, then you're really, you know, at a disadvantage. There's very few places to go. So the flexibility, that's one of the reasons why there's a flexibility in the, in the U.S. labor market that both um, is troubling because it leads to poverty and, you know, high levels of poverty by, by both men and women. Um, but you also see more women who have higher education, particularly when they're single, doing well. So if you look at the kinds of occupations that women have, and, and um, more able to go back to work after um, having uh, a child. So it's very, the labor market is so rigidly structured around this model, it's very difficult to get back on track. Um, so it truly is um, a, a dualism that is very um, difficult to, uh, um, uh, to, to, it's not really a transition or a bridge. Um, as it is but you know, I think it's not, it's not only what happens to women, and from my understanding is that when you graduate from college or high school, you know, you go on, I mean, they have a word for this, you know, label, looking for a job. That's a really big deal. If you're in college, you usually do it when you're a junior. And the window, I mean, the port of entry is a nice way of saying this, because the port of entry is also, the timing of entry is really short in Japan. So you, you go on this, this job hunt, you know, and you have, and it's like about a year, a year or two, and you're, you're hot for about a year or two. And after that, you get cold really quickly. So if you haven't secured your regular job within that time period, and you go into temporary, part-time, dispatch, whatever, you're kind of stuck. And so a lot of the period in Japan have written about being stuck, whether you're male or female, right. whether you make this choice. Right. I mean, you don't, you don't even have this choice. Right. It is for Because people. if you haven't gotten that job, you're mm -hmm. probably you're not going to get it. Unlike, right. you know, in the U.S., you still could get a chance, you know, when you're a lot older. But it's been much... I mean, it'd be interesting yeah. to know if that's going to change, because it's also like, well, that's what, um, man, yeah. you know, you're 23, and you've already, and what happens with a lot of the precariat is that they know that they've already, they've already lost it. Right. You know, they're not, that, they're not going to be able to do anything. Well, what's happening now is one, one of the um, consequences is a lot of people uh, stay, uh, staying with their uh, parents and living with their parents, so that precarity is kind of subsidized by the, so the social reproduction of the family. 
uh, that's very high in Japan. Japan is like Italy, um, and it's even higher than, than Taiwan. So that's one of the ways to sort of manage this precarity is through this kind of family reproduction. Um, and that's something that um, Suwako Shirahasa at the University of Tokyo is writing about. She does it uh, comparatively if anyone's interested um, in that. Um, but it truly is, um, uh, Dave, uh, David Slater, who I'm sure you know, <laughs> um, is writing about <coughs> uh, uh, young men who are choosing, and they're actually choosing to be non-regular. Um, and it's unclear to him, and, and that's why it goes in his questions. We don't know. It's, it really is too early to know. Will they get back on track? Will they feel compelled, if they can, you know, to be salary men? Um, or will they, you know, really try to um, cut a different path and therefore create, you know, um, demands on, on this labor system that is rigid for, for everyone? So yeah. I have one, one follow-up question related to that is, um, like, like it, from what I understand about the current situation in Japan, is you have a rapidly aging and, and even shrinking uh, workforce. Right, and the fertility rate has been low for quite a while. So, so it just seems like this model that, that's being described is just crazily in, in, inefficient or ineffective for that scenario. Like, like you've got, have all, all the, and this kind of painting it a human capital perspective, but nonetheless. I forgive you. I know, I hesitate to put it in those terms, but you have all these people out there who could be contributing so much more than they are if the system wasn't so rigid, but that they're just frozen out. Um, it just seems for Japan's challenges that that would have to change, and also that that theoretically would give workers more power, like, like, they're, like they're, they're in a different side of that. Chain. Like, like we looked at China, I mean, you know, how much power can workers have when there's so many of them chasing so relatively few jobs. But Japan, it seems the opposite. It seems like there were the conditions would be there both for the interest of the system and also because workers should have relatively more power, you know, for, for, for this to change. I mean... Well, um, there, there is a sense of that there's, there's so embedded in this kind of um, uh, consensus negotiation within the firm that they are trying to preserve the jobs they have within their companies. And that's what the agenda has been for uh, the workers. <coughs> um, although there's a recognition um, that they do, you know, uh, and, uh, and sort of uh, an, an empowerment of workers. In 1989, they formed Rengo, which is their version of the AFL. Uh, CIO. So there really was sort of a uh, necessity that we have to have a national uh, federation um, that is devoted to organizing the unorganized. Although there's problems, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but there, but so so there is this kind of you know, new body um, that is trying to, to organize. But they're still stuck in that old system. How do you you know move away? And that's the the, the the difficulty of this kind of path. Dependency. You have to really break away, um, and that's uh, I think quite difficult. But you're you're right. Um, uh, there, but there are these other movements kind of percolating. Um, and what the disaster has done um, is it's re-energized the nuclear power, the anti-nuclear uh, movement, and a lot of the labor movement. This is where the uh, their energy has been focused. Uh, if anyone's interested, um, I have from. Uh, a group of labor activists from Japan, um, some, you know, uh, a, a film about their organizing. Um, and the real, and I think that uh, there's been massive um, demonstrations everywhere. Um, so I think that that may be a, a catalyst for a new kind of uh, organizing around a new set of issues that sort of um, bring together a lot of these other kinds of issues. Bring together, there's lots of NGOs. I mean, the one thing that is so interesting about uh, the Japanese labor organizations, there are uh, temporary workers unions, there are part-time workers unions, there are um, uh, day laborers unions, migrant worker unions, there's a managers, uh, managers, it's not managers, but a managers union. Um, um, so you have this, you know, uh, and this is the, uh, the second wave, there's a, um, uh, Kira uh, Suzuki has done a kind of analysis of what because the second wave community unions in Japan, it's you know relatively strong. I mean, it's still tiny, but so is Occupy 
um, Chapel Hill, um, and we'll see. <laughs> um, there's about five tenths, but you know, but it means it's something more. And I think that um, the disaster is catalyzing people. There's conversations and, and things around these kinds of issues. So um, there is some hope that the organizing that has been there since the 1990s, there has been this kind of grassroots organizing, um, and it's beginning to sort of. Um, crystallize and uh, network together. Um, and I was part of a project of network in some of these organizations. And I can talk about it next. Um, Arnie, you have... I think you sort of answered it. I was wondering if there was going to be uh, something analogous to the Indignados in Spain or the, or the Occupy Wall Street, sort of a, around this being stuck kind of thing. You got a lot of uh, highly educated uh, yeah. people with no prospects. Um, it's not a good, it's a good recipe for organizing. I was right. wondering if there was some, but you mentioned they organize around specific issues like nuclear. Right. I think um, because that's so dramatic, um, so that what that's doing is bringing together all these small little fragmented decentralized. One of the problems, one of the benefits of, of decentralized is it's very grassroots, it's very attentive to those kinds of issues, it's organic, um, it, they're fluid, that's great. But at the same time, they're decentralized, they're fragmented. All those things that are both, you know, benefits and advantages can be disadvantages. As we know, um, and what is happening with a disaster? And, and I'm getting um, uh, these dispatches uh, from my uh, college who are labor activists. This is not just from people who are just, you know, um, in the peace movement, which also there's a peace movement active. But this is the labor act of seeing this as a kind of sort of spearhead mm -hmm. to move this agenda because there are part-time, uh, there's a union for part-time workers, temporary workers, but they're like in their own little space. Uh, this is a way to bring it together in the kind of national highlight that we need to change. I mean, how could you not, I mean, you have to change these, these uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. It's just so clear that you can't talk about um, equality and equal employment on the one hand, and then deny it to those very people who need it the most. You know, so, so those tensions are, are really interesting, and they're playing out in, in interesting ways, I think. So I think Japan you know, is a country to, to return to. It was, used to be, and Japan was everywhere. That's why all of us sort of, you know, couldn't help but study Japan, uh, those of us who were not area studies people um, to, uh, to start with. Uh, but it's now another place to, to go. It's, it's quite interesting because of those kind of new movements that, that uh, exist in the social movements. I was wondering, um, this is a slightly different topic, a couple, a couple questions. Um, you showed that like, uh, unlike the U.S. and a lot of other places, women with more education are not more likely to be employed than women who have lower education, like in particular the um, college degree versus two-year college degree. And I was wondering about um, what the kind of return to education for women currently is in Japan? Like, do does a young woman who has a bachelor's degree does she have better employment opportunities than a woman woman with, say, just an AA or a high school diploma? Or are all women sort of by virtue of gender generally? No, they're not. They're not. I mean, class really does make a difference. Uh, uh -huh. Absolutely, and and using education as a proxy for class, indeed, <coughs> the kinds of jobs. So you see, what's interesting about the labor market, those of us uh, when we study Scandinavian countries, at least Sweden, you see it's so sex segregated, you know, in terms of the kinds of jobs that women have because they're, you know, sort of congregated in the public sector. And you have a large welfare state with a large public sector. It's not the case in Japan. So those jobs, the same with the U.S., it's one of the issues that's why if you look at who's, um, who is in, uh, in the forefront of Ohio and Wisconsin, you see the teachers, uh, a lot of women, because that's where a lot of the gains in the, in the set of professions were made in the 1980s for women in uh, the U.S., but also uh, cross-nationally, um, in Germany as well. But in Japan, uh, there's there's not many places to go. But there are, you can, you can become a manager, but it's so um, uh, organized around non-responsibility for care. I mean, you have very, I mean, talk about long hours. I mean, and, and even working class people have long hours. You go out and, and go to the bar, and I, I don't drink except for lots of coffee and, and, and uh, water. And, but it's like obligatory. And it's like, what's wrong with you? Like, I still want to go drink. I'm tired. <laughs> don't make me. But, but so you go drinking before your lecture, you go drinking after your lecture, and then you know, it's like a 10 hour you know, uh, <laughs> event uh, that, that is part of the process of, you know, 
Um, but it is, uh, there are different, um, you know, sort of uh, trajectories. A lot 